great song of worship and praise. It's good to see you. Boy, we had a great time in this auditorium yesterday with our men's wild game feast. Uh, ate too much. Had a good time, though. Hey, not, not to fear. I think we saved some possum and some raccoon for some of y'all. Uh, some fried possum lips or whatever they were. I don't know. But it was really fantastic. I had a great crowd of men here. Uh, just, it's always good to see men come together and honor the Lord. And then we did uh, great speaker, Fred Caldwell, did, did a great job in, in uh, ministering and challenging our men. So all in all, it was just incredible. Poor ladies that came to help. They had to work real hard. And we appreciate them for sure. But it was a great, great time. I think these get better every year. Let's continue, continue that journey. Amen. If you missed it, not to worry. Just in a few weeks from now, we have our men's retreat that comes. So uh, I'm sure Tim will share something with that later. If he hadn't already, be sure and get signed up for that. Just in case anybody calls. Let me get that out there. Huh? <laughs> That's my alarm clock. How I many of y'all quit wearing watches when you got smartphones? I don't know about you. But anyway, praise the Lord. It was good to hear Fred Caldwell yesterday as he shared some things uh, uh, just uh, about men and the call to men. The general, basically, it's the word of God to all of us, men or women. But he shared an interesting survey that he said he'd read recently. He said it was a survey that was given to people who were 90 years old and up. Because there were three things that came out of this particular survey that they discovered that was common between all these 90-year-olds and uh, First was this. Oh, oh, there were three things that came up. The first one had to do with uh, risk. They said they wish they'd taken more risk in their life. And uh, I think that's a lot of people just seek to live as comfortable as they can instead of having adventures in life. The second thing they said was reflection. They wish they'd have taken more time to reflect. And that was in the context of uh, slowing down, making sure you're where you're supposed to be and what's going on in your life, and you're heading in the right direction. And the third thing was interesting, the desire to leave a legacy, to leave something behind. It makes a difference in the lives of the people who are coming in behind them. As I listened to that, it was, pretty, it was, it was interesting to me because uh, that's where so many Christians need to come back and, and, and realize that, hey, don't get to the end of your life and realize that you didn't take the risk that God wanted you to take. Because if you are going to be what God's called you to be, there's going to be a lot of risk involved. Secondary, there was that time of reflection. And that's what I want this whole month to be on Sundays. We come together in this service. I, I, I've told you for a few weeks now the things that the Lord was laying on my heart to, to share with our, with our fellowship and with our church. And I believe the things that God wants to speak to us is I really sought God's face and prayed about it. We came up with a simple word called uh, uh, higher. And I believe that's where we are. I believe we should never get content with status quo. We should never be, uh, feel too comfortable with mediocrity. You know, somebody said they feel like they're in a rut. Remember, just a rut is just a grave with the ends kicked out. We should never be settled and satisfied with what's just going on. I think we have to come back to the premise of genuine discipleship, genuine Christianity, what it really does mean to be a Christian, to be a believer, is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Discipleship, at all costs, no sacrifice is too big. Whatever God wants and whatever God desires. How often have you sat and heard testimonies or maybe even read biographies of people who accomplished great things for God? Sometimes we have people come to the church and missionaries and share testimony of you know, where they're at and what's going on and the, and the call that God's put on their life. And something usually characterizes every one of those testimonies or biographies that you read from these kind of people. It's usually one thing that comes out, it kind of flows to the top, it's similar with all of them. One is the obvious appeal to, uh, to respond to that call to God to take it to the next level. But there's also that element of suffering that comes in. And we sit back as Christians and many times there's, there's something in us that sees people who are stretching to be everything God's called them to be and stepping out and taking giant leaps of faith to go where God leads them, to be where God wants them, to make sacrifice in their life. And we, we admire those things and we look at those things and kind of just reflect and say, well, that's, that's, that's fabulous. But there's something that I really believe it's the Spirit of God in us, but it appeals to us. What did Paul the Apostle say? He said, you know, here's, here's what it's about. My goal is to know him. The power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his... But that's not the byword for the day, is it? We want comfort. We want to be, we want to be you know coddled, we want to be, you know, nurtured to and blessed and receive and be taught and hear and take notes and enjoy. Uh, but you know, I, I, it, we admire it in others, but what about when it comes to our own life? I strongly believe that if we're going to take wherever we're at in our life to the next level, it always requires sacrifice. 
Leaving something to get somewhere else. Leaving, forsaking something, and abandoning something to go higher, to go where, wherever it might be that God's calling us to, to, to take on the challenge for, for our spiritual walk in our life. And not to be satisfied with status quo in any way whatsoever, but to follow what it is that God has for our lives. And we come to Jesus Christ at the cross and we originally say to him, I surrender, I surrender all. But then so often we find ourselves trying to embrace everything the world has for us instead of everything that God would have for us. And we sacrifice, oh, not in the sense of our own comforts and materialism, but we sacrifice in the context of what God has for us. We're not getting what he wants for us. We're not achieving where, where, where he wants us to achieve. We're, we're, not, we're not moving to that place he wants. And so there's a sacrifice, so to say, but we're sacrificing all the wrong things. It really, my heart and I believe even the heart of the Lord is, as we get into to, to looking where we're at in our life, is, is to, to take it higher. We know we just finished the Olympics and the, the motto for the Olympics is Sitius, Altius, Fortius, which means basically faster, higher, stronger. And that's, we're, we admire those athletes who discipline themselves and sacrifice at great lengths to, to train, to prepare, to be quicker than last year, to, be, to take it to the next level, to go farther and faster and higher than what it ever was before. And the heartbeat, I believe, of, of, for our, all believers ought to be that. Not that we would receive, as the Apostle Paul said, an earthly crown, but a heavenly one. So that when we stand before God on that day, whatever that day may be for any of us, we do not know exactly, but we're all going to stand before the Lord and give an account. I want to hear, and I believe every Christian wants to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. That should, that should be our desire. I mean, and I really believe that if you are a Christian, there's something in you that, that, that desires that and that, that longs that. If that's absent from your life, then you might start questioning your, your spiritual condition. Because if you are genuinely a child of God, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. In other words, God himself inhabits your body. He's the one who gives us the desire for greater things for, for glory, for, for grace, for, for his riches, for his blessings upon our life. He's the one who gives us desire to, to, to leave behind the world and press on to know the things of God. And so as we look at this sermon series I just entitled Higher, just by the way of introduction, I, I'm going to give you, and we may refer to these things over the next few weeks, but I, I'm going to give you uh, some questions that, that you can consider as we get into this series. And they're kind of an inventory type questions. And the first one is, you know, where I am I in, in my walk of faith? Right here, right now, today. Stop for a moment. Not where we think we are, not where we'd like to be, not where we just came from, but how are things with me and God right now? And how are things with me, let's a bit more specifically, how are things with me in the will of God right now? The second one is, is not just, it, it's similar to the first, but it, it kind of takes it obviously the next step. Uh, discovering where I am, but also where am I headed in my walk of faith? If you don't know where you are, you're not going to get where you're headed. I mean, even, even my phone, if I ask for directions, you know, on the smartphone, you put it in, I'm going to go to such, 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 such address. And then it, it says, where do you want directions from? Well, duh. <laughs> but hey, let's apply that to our life. We know where we're going. Where are we? If I don't know where I am, I'm not going to get where I'm going. And so I have to put in, I hit that little button down here, it's had a little arrow on my, my iPhone, it's, it's for current location. So I'm asking today, what's your current location? Oh, well, I'm at 21603 Road Road in Spring, Texas. No, 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 no. Where are you spiritually? Where are you in your walk with God? Where are you in your relationships? Just kind of be honest enough to take a, a simple inventory of, of where you're at and where you're headed because those two things work together. The next thing is, then what's hindering me? Now that I know where I am and where I'm going, what's hindering me getting to the, to the goal now? All right. Which brings you, obviously, I think, to the fourth step of this is, then what, what do I need to do? If I know where I'm going, know where I am, know what's hindering me, what's my next step? Now, the Christian life, we know, and you see this through the Old Testament and the New Testament, simply boils down, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in depth in a minute, to a journey. All right? We are on a journey. Now, praise God for his presence in our life as we make this journey. I love the Old Testament. We have the tabernacle. It says, and God tabernacled with them, all right? So that we're in this journey, and we're in this journey with the Lord, and we should know where we're going in this journey, and we're going to talk about these things. Because in Hebrews chapter 11, one of my favorite chapters, and many of you love that chapter of the Bible as well, 
because it talks about those great accomplishments of people for the glory of God. We call them the heroes of faith. It's the kind of the hall of fame. All right. Now, there's some other chapters that have the hall of shame in it, but I don't want to be in that one. I want to be over in the hall of fame when it's all finalized. Amen. The hall, and we read the stories of, of these people who accomplished, I mean, un, incredible things for God and, and just saw the blessings of God in their life. And there should be some kind of, I, I think, perhaps a sanctified envy. You know, I want that. I want to be the ones that God says, I am pleased. Faith, you know, without faith, it's impossible to please God, but I want to please God. So as we talk about these questions and this journey and our life, obviously we're talking about our walk and relationship with God, our faith life and our faith walk. In Hebrews chapter 11, we're just going to look at a few verses, verses 13 through 16, maybe 17 if we get that far. And he's talking about all these people and it's mentioned Enoch and Moses and Abraham and Sarah, all right. He's mentioned all these, what we'd call these heroes of faith. He said they all died in faith without receiving the promise. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That's a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Oh, great passage. But in these few little verses here, you find the heartbeat of the disciple that makes the difference in the world they live in. You find the heartbeat of a follower of Jesus Christ who's got things in the right order, who's answering the right questions in the right way and doing what needs to be done in their walk on. These are not perfect people. We could talk about their failures a long time. But it says that God was pleased with them. And even before this is how do we please God? You know, well, it's faith that pleases God. So if I'm going to be what God's called me to be, then I'm going to have to be a faith follower of Jesus Christ. I'm going to have to believe God. I'm going to have to trust his word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I'm going to have to hear the word of God, believe the word of God, and pursue God's will as it's revealed from the word of God. If you're with me, say, uh-huh. So again, we look back at this and, and, and think of the context, pleasing God. Well, what if God is not pleased, then what is he? Well, he tells you in this verse, he says, and God is not ashamed to be called their God. So pleasing or ashamed? How many have children? How many times have you been ashamed? <laughs> Those are my kids. And you tell your wife, can't you straighten your kids up? Or your wife tells her, did you see what your kids are doing? Because we're not necessarily wanting to bring some ownership over the deal at that point. It's got to be their kids. Now, I have kids. My kids have embarrassed me on more occasions than I call. Sometimes it's my own problem. Sometimes it's just kids being kids, you know. Our kids misbehaving. There have been other times when I'm just sorely pleased and puff up like a wild peacock, you know, because you're so happy and so excited and so pleased over them making the right choice, the right decision, acting in the right way. God put that in us as parents, all right? God's our heavenly father. God wants to be pleased with our lives. And what brings him pleasure, he says, well, obviously the very first step of bringing God pleasure and honoring God and pleasing him, it's a, it's a life of faith. But unfortunately, many times we will confess to one another, I'm living a life of faith and we are so far from it. We're like the scribes and the Pharisees of Jesus' day whom he continually rebuked for their hypocrisy because they had a form of religion, but it excluded God. It excluded real faith. They had, they, had a, they had a process they were going through. There was religiosity, but there was no practicality of loving God with heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. Faith gets back to that. If I'm living by faith, walking by faith, I'm loving God. I mean, we just did seven weeks in the book of James on faith and action. I think this is the obvious next step to follow that series on the book of James. We go through verse by verse where he talks about real faith. And if you have real faith, then real faith embraces actions and activity and deeds and works and, and service and fulfilling your responsibilities to the church, to Christ, to each other, to the world, being what God's called you to be, getting your, your, your heart right, your attitudes right, your relationships right. Why do we do all that? Because we believe God. And we believe the word of God. And if we believe the word of God, then we respond accordingly. So how do we, how do we, 
come to that place in our life to be like these people who said when God saw them, he was not ashamed. Now, it means kind of this idea of, of, of embarrassment almost is, is the concept here. The Greek word comes from a word which means to dishonor or to make ashamed, all right? He says, but here God's not ashamed. Now, in Romans, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. We have no reason to be ashamed with God or with the gospel, do we? None whatsoever. And if you do, then you've been misinformed. And you certainly need to be enlightened on the glory of God. The Bible speaks of those even who will be ashamed at his coming. In 1 John, he says, now little children, abide in him. There's the key. Walk in Jesus, live for Jesus, that when he shall appear, you may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Live a life so if Christ showed up today, it wouldn't be an embarrassment. You wouldn't feel like you just got caught by your parents doing something you shouldn't be doing. Amen? Now, if you don't know Christ and you've, you've for some reason rejected the word of God and rejected Jesus and a commitment that's public and open for Christ in your life, then, then you have every reason to be ashamed. Jesus says for those people in Luke 9, 26, he said, whoever's ashamed of me and my words, the son of man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of his father and of his angels. So if you don't know Christ today, if you've never really made a, a real commitment of your heart and life to Christ, then man, all I can say to you, you don't want to come to that place in life when, when God calls the righteous before him and, and those who have put their trust and faith in him and been unashamed to embrace him and his word and his truth. Hey, those people are coming forward and, and being received in the glory of God. Rejection on the other part, those because you were ashamed of him and of his words, he said, when Jesus comes with his glory and his glory, he's ashamed of you. And we should never, obviously, anyway, it doesn't take a lot of deep theologians to figure this out. We should never be ashamed of the Lord. Sometimes we've been ashamed to the Lord, but not ashamed of the Lord. In fact, the Bible lets us know very clear that as Christians, that we are on, I guess for lack of better words, we're on display. Paul said, your letters to be read of all men. A city set on a hill, you can't miss it. Shining. A light on a candlestick, not under the bushel, not under the bed, shining. We are to be obvious in the world we live in. And I think it, kind of, it goes like this. Nobody should have to guess if I'm a Christian or not. It shouldn't be up for debate. It ought to be pretty obvious. That guy loves Jesus. That guy, that guy is committed to Christ. Why? Look at the direction of his life. He's going somewhere. He's following somebody. Now, all of us are following somebody. It really gets down in our life. We think it may be ourselves or friends or loved ones, whatever job, career. It really gets down to Jesus said, you know, if you're not for me, you're against me. So if you're not following, you're forsaking. If you're not discipling, you're deserting. It gets, it's, it's pretty simple that way. Now, I, I'm feeling this kind of uncomfortable quietness into the room. <laughs> I'm here for you. <laughs> I'm here with you. I, I desire with all my heart to be what God wants me to be. I believe most of you, it, 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 all of you, if you know Jesus, do as well. All right? At the same time, we all know that we are not perfect. You know I am not the perfect pastor. You've talked to your friends about it before, right? <laughs> How do you know? I talked to your friends too. They told on you. <laughs> So, you know, but that's not, we're pursuing Christ, right? And in the process, we know each other's shortcomings. We know, each, in fact, the more we live together and the more we fellowship, the more we're going to know about each other. But one thing we should know about is, hey, you know, he may have some, some issues here, but hey, he's going on. He's pressing on. He desires to know God. He desires to live for Jesus. He desires to walk with God. Now, if you look at this little, little snippet of scripture in Hebrews, you see that their faith had some obvious telltale signs about it. I mean, you see, if you look very closely, the reasons they were not ashamed to call God their God, nor was God ashamed to be called their God. And he breaks it down here. The first point I want you to catch is this. They saw the promises of God. I mean, let me just go back and read that little scripture to you again. It says here, all these died in faith without receiving the promise, but having seen them. <coughs> they saw the promises of God. Now, this seeing that takes place here, I believe more than anything else, it's, it's a spiritual seeing, it's, it's revelation. Not just, I can read the promises of God. You know the difference when you first heard Jesus loves you, died for you, and could save you from your sin, and you were a sinner needing salvation. And, and then you know the difference in that time when God opened your eyes to that. Boom, it's like lights come on, right? The lights are on. These people see the promises of God. 
that's, that's not just a one-time event for us as Christians. We have to constantly be coming back to the Word of God and constantly be seeing the promises of God. If we're going to have the kind of faith where it says, and God was not ashamed to be called their God, that's where we have to come to. It, it's a process of seeing, not saw, and seeing the promises of God. Not just past tense, but right now. What's God saying to me? What's God saying to you? Where's God leading you, as we said in those early questions? And am I seeing what God's doing there? And am I willing not only just to kind of perceive it, but am I willing to really see it? To believe it, to have confidence in it, to, to, to obey it and, and, and to trust it. They saw the promises of God. Where are the promises of God found? Obviously in the Lord Jesus and in his word. I love when it goes, goes out of Hebrews chapter 11. And, you know, remember, again, these books were divided in chapters and verses later for reference. It's just to flow. When he leaves Hebrews chapter 11 right into chapter 12, where he talks about, you know, Jesus and looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You know, we look unto him. We're seeing him. And it says, it says, he says, we are fixing our eyes on Jesus. What's that mean? I'm not looking to the right. I'm not going to look to the left. I'm going to fix my eyes on Christ. And I want you to know, folks, it's easy to fix your eyes on a lot of things in church. This was a problem with the Pharisees. They fix their eyes on all the wrong stuff in their culture and in their theology and in their religion. And they miss the mark. And it's so easy to do that in our spiritual life. To fix our eyes on people, on situations, on circumstances, on things, and enter into that little world of, of, of Phariseeism and hypocrisy in our spiritual life where we're not growing, we're not glowing, we're not being what God's called us to be. And we're just missing the mark, and that's when we kind of get in the rut, and we, we're, that's when we start complaining, and we start, you know, all this stuff enters in because we're not, we're not enjoying Jesus anymore. And if you find yourself in a day where you're not enjoying Jesus anymore, step back. Where am I? Where am I going? What's stopping me from getting there? You know, am I going to set my sights, get my eyes fixed back on Jesus Christ? And the unique thing about these people is they look to the promises of God, kept their eyes on the main thing, kept the main thing, the main thing. Yeah, there's lots of minor things to deal with. We deal with them, but we always deal with them in the context of Jesus, the word. What does the Bible say? How do we deal with it from the scripture? How do we address this from the word of God? Too often, I've seen so many churches even come to places of splits, not over the Bible, but over philosophical differences of how something needs to be dealt with. Have you got anything to do with the Bible? It's all philosophy, how they perceive the problem. And boy, we make such a tragic mistake, and boy, Satan loves to do that, doesn't he? He just loves to do that. So first of all, they saw the promises of God. You're going to have to listen faster. i got a lot to say. <laughs> the second thing is they were persuaded, it says. Not only did they see them, but it says they were persuaded by, them, by these promises. And, and it's the word for welcome here. It's, it's the idea of welcoming something. In fact, it's, it's uh, I think one or two or three translations use that word. And they greeted them. One such translation says they welcomed them. New America says, says they were persuaded by them. And every one of those is accurate. Because the Greek word here would be spelled P-E-I-T-H-O, pitho. And it literally means those same things, to embrace, the, to, to be persuaded by something, to be confident about something, to be a friend of something. In fact, that's the way that word is translated in the Bible in different places. Assure, believe, confident, friend, obey, persuade, trust, yield. So they saw it and they believed it. In fact, that word is used most of the time being translated as the word, let me spell it for you, because it's a four-letter word. O-B-E-Y. Let's say that together. Obey. They saw him. They, they obeyed him. Why did they obey him? Because they, they were convinced. In other words, it's a persuasion and a confidence that brings about obedience. That's what it really boils down to. And if I want to be that kind of person, he says, I'm going I'm to go higher. I'm going to be what God calls me to be. I'm not going to settle for mediocrity in my life. I'm, I'm, I'm going to step out of the average, the norm. You know, I don't want to be, me, I don't be lukewarm. I want to be what God's called me to be. And I'm going to look to God, and I'm going to get focused on his promise. I'm going to get focused on Jesus Christ. I'm going to get centered on him. And I'm going to believe what he tells me to the point of obedience. Because so many people fail at this point. They say, I believe it, but they don't obey it. They don't, they don't, they're not persuaded by it is basically what they're saying. It gets a little bit, and I started to add one more point here about discernment. You know, they saw the truth and they were discerning, and there is that element here. But it kind of goes into this third point here. It says, not only they greet them and they were persuaded by them, saw them, but they were also, it says, and they embraced the promises of God. 
So they, they see them or they persuaded and welcomed them and then they embraced them. Now, I believe the translators in some translations didn't use the word welcome here because the second word embrace kind of has that context to it. it, it it's the word aspasmoi, like aspasmodic or something, right? But it, it, it's a word which was used in the Greek language of, uh, when, when you would say goodbye and greet somebody, uh, you give them a hug, pat them on the back, and you, you, know, you, you say farewell. And it was also used in the context of greeting them and welcoming them. And you, you, I mean, many of you this morning, I watched you it, during the welcome time a while ago, you're patting each other back, you give each other a hug, you, you're receiving each other, you're embracing one another. You know, this is what they did with the Word of God. They welcomed it like a friend, like a loved one. And it is living, it's the Word of God. And they received it. And I mean, it wasn't, here comes the Bible. And I know some of you may be saying this morning, this attitude of grimacing almost. Oh, no, he's going to preach one of those sermons. <laughs> now, how many of you have seen some of those YouTube clips or Funniest American videos or, or seen even some of the advertisements for Disney World? And you, and you see where the parent goes in and they surprise the kids, we're going to Disney World. How many of you have seen some of those? And the kids just go freaky. I mean, they go, Disney World! <laughs> We're going to Disney World. And they run around the house doing flips and all kinds of stuff. I, that was a little radical, but that didn't even cover what I've seen, all right? They're all pumped up in Disney World. I think that's the way he's talking about here. That's the idea. The Word of God. A challenge. A promise. Instead of saying, oh, it's going to cost me something. Let me ask you, what are you going to sacrifice? Compared to what you will sacrifice if you don't do the will of God. The sacrifice for not doing the will of God is greater than the sacrifice you would experience in any kind of earthly context. They embraced it. They received it. And that word has to do with that welcome and embracing and loving. In fact, it's used a lot in Romans 16. There's a lot of one another's there and how we respond to the church and the body of Christ. That word is used 21 times in that one chapter about embracing. In different ways, different contexts. The fourth thing, you still with me, say, uh-huh. We didn't get as many uh-huhs that time. The fourth thing is they confessed the promises. Uh, read it to you again from that, that verse. Is, uh, These died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them, having welcomed them, having from a distance embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So here's the idea. Not only do they see it and believe it, embrace it, it says they confessed it. Now this is a, a word the Vines Dictionary says, this is a confession that's, that's the, the, the byproduct or the effect of deep conviction. I say it because I really believe it. That's the same word used in 1 John 1, 9, when it says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. Well, we praise the Lord for that verse. I, I know I do. I, I use it all the time. <laughs> if we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But that, here's that same word. It's a compound word in the Greek for the word homo, which means the same, and logos. And it's a homologio. It's homologos. It means the same words. Logos is for words, same words. So if we, if we, same words about our sin, as God says, basically, if we agree with God, Confess our sin. What, where's that confession? I'm convicted about my sin, so I'm confessing. Amen. I don't confess my sins if I'm not really convicted about them, do I? Holy Spirit, you touched my heart. I'm wrong in this area of my life. I want to get it right with God. So I say the same thing about my sin that God says about it. I say with God what it is. It's wrong. It's an offense to you, God. I have failed. I have fallen short. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Because at the cross, you forgave me of my sins, and I can be free of my sins. This is, I'm saying what God says about my sin. That's what it means to confess my sin. So God, I, I thank you that I've, uh, there's admission and there's restoration and there's cleansing and there's sanctification and there's fullness that comes in my life. There's forsaking of sin and following Christ. That's to confess your sin. It doesn't mean run to the Pope or the priest or whoever else, sit in a box and, and you know, be told to do four Hail Marys and count your beads. And go back and do it again. Nor anymore that means coming to an altar in a, in a Protestant church and telling God a list of some things you've done wrong and then go back out and do them again. That's not confession, is it? So he said, what they do? They confess the promises of God. They believe with a deep conviction what they saw and what they heard in the words of God, and they, th something happened. 
In fact, he, he, he identifies this embracing, this welcoming, this confession in the next few verses. He shows how it plays out when we, when we really see and we're persuading and embrace and welcome the promises of God and we confess the promise of God. What's that look like? Isn't it good the way God just lays it all out here? I just love the Bible, you know, uh, it's, especially for people. I'm not a smart person. You know, Charity laughs because she knows that. She's my sister. <laughs> That's another confession. That's, you know, that's why someone told me one time, well, Pastor, you make the sermon so simple. I said, one, because I am simple, and two, because it is. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. That might be an interference, by the way. Childlike, simple faith, here's what God said, let's just believe it. And it, it, it's demonstrated in several ways here. And, and, and let me give you these, just a few points of how, how it's manifest, because... It, what it really boils down to, if we really believe and if we're really living a life that pleases God, if we're really, if we're really moving forward, then it's manifested in really two ways. It's, it's all this breaks down to one, it's manifested in our words, our confessions, and it's manifested in our works, our lives. You know, a lot of people have confessions, but they don't have any work. You know, they're willing to tell you how to do church, but they don't do church. They're willing to tell you how church ought to be. But they wouldn't go to church. You know, they want to tell you what a Christian ought to be like, but they're not one. I mean, you know what I'm saying? And even the church, you can transition that in. A lot of people in the church tell you how to do church, but they don't do anything. Can I get a witness? <laughs> you know, they're, they're there to inform, but never to be transformed. And so now what he's saying here is that if you really have a faith that pleases God, if you really do, I want you to know there's going to be some, a manifestation of it. Because faith without works, we read over the last seven weeks, is what? Dead. Dead. So here's how their faith was manifest. First of all, it's manifest in identification. I, I like this word because it, basically what it says about him and what they say about it, they confess that they were what? Strangers and exiles, pilgrims in this world. In other words, they knew who they were. And I, I really believe the problem with a lot of believers is they, they don't know who they are. And when you discover who you are, your world's going to change. Your life's going to change. Your family's going to change. I believe every aspect of your life will change when you begin to realize who you really are. You know, most people I deal with who are living in strongholds and bondages in their life, carrying on jar garbage year after year and year after year, because they don't know who they are. They don't know what God did for them. When that passage says in 2 Corinthians 5, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. You know what that means? If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. And if you read it carefully, it goes on to say, you're not what you used to be. You changed. The problem is we still believe we are what we used to be. We're just convinced of it. Why? Because I feel it. And I sense it. And in my circumstances. These people did not look at what they felt like and what they saw and what their circumstances or what their culture dictated. They looked and saw something else. And in the result of seeing someone else and the word of God, the something else, it changed what they were. And they realized they were not what they used to be. If your attitude, well, I'm used to poor, backslidden Baptist, that's probably what you are. <laughs> Amen. You're probably, and you're probably doing a real good job at it. Because that's who you think you are. And, you know, once, but once you settle this issue, this is what I am. I am not a, ashamed of Christ and he's not ashamed of me. You know, I was that. I'm now this. I was, I was lost. I'm now found. I was blind. Now I see. I was, I was a person who had to do whatever sin led me to do, whatever my flesh told me to do, whatever the world dictated. I'm not like that anymore. I don't have to do that. They were strangers and they were exiles. Don't you love those words? Pilgrims. It's the word xenos in the Greek language means alien. They were aliens. I'm a legal one, by the way. But I am not, this is not my home. You know, I love this country. I salute my flag. I support the military. I vote. Why well, take that for a while, huh? I do all those things. I want to be a good citizen. But first of all, my citizenship is not of this world. He says, you are pilgrims. All right? A pilgrim is someone who says going from point A to point B, and they're not happy till they get there. Amen. Nothing's going to deter them. They realize that what they're going through, and again, that concept of the Old Testament, you see this over and over again, of uh, people going on to something better, the concept of the New Testament, you know, the tabernacle, the tent, everything, it's all made to be portable. 
And we're portable. We're, we're moving through from that point to the, I am not moving through from Harris Memorial Methodist Hospital in Fort Worth, Texas, born in 1951. That is old, isn't it? In 19, some of you older, so don't say anything. 1951, going over here to a marble slab on a piece of dirt, three feet wide, six feet long, six feet deep. That's not where I'm headed. I may go through that little place. That may be my turf for a moment, but I'm headed on. In fact, I won't be there. My other corkers will be. This is, this is the idea of Scripture. We're, we're pilgrims. We're, we're passing through this in our home. And once we can get that down in our head, guess what will change? A multitude of things. All kinds of stuff. I realize I don't have to have a bigger house, bigger house, bigger house, better car, better car, better car, better look, better, better, more clothes, more clothes, more clothes, more shoes. Popular, gotta be popular, gotta, be popular. gotta get, gotta get love me at school. Listen, you know where those people are going to be a couple years from now? Nowhere near you. I'm always amazed to watch people go back in Facebook and try to discover the past in high school. You were miserable then. Why would you want to go back now? I mean, the worst years of my life were those years. You do puberty and sorting all that stuff out in your head and who likes who and what, you know. Man, leave that behind. I'm done with that. Just passing through, Amen. Some of you need to get a grip on life and reality. It doesn't end here on this planet. We are headed somewhere else, but understanding that I am not what I used to be. I'm a new person. It changes everything. All of a sudden, when I realize I'm a child of God, I'm a part of the body of Christ, the very living entity of Jesus on the earth, representing the kingdom of God. I'm here as a child of God, an ambassador for Christ. I, <laughs> man, I, that kind of changes your attitude, doesn't it? I used to love to check in the hotels. I traveled all the time in evangelism. Many of you know that. And the hotel cards have changed now. They just swipe your card. They used to have fill little forms, you know. And it was like, who's your name? Where are you from? And what's your occupation? Always write down ambassador. You know. Where's your home? Heaven. You know, I did that for 17 years. I never had one clerk at the hotel desk ever say anything. They look at it. Follow it away. It's nice to have you here, Mr. Arms. <laughs> now, I would say something. But I tell you, sometimes it got you a better seat on the plane when you told me you were an ambassador. <laughs> well, what country do you represent? The biggest, the best. Heaven. I'm an ambassador. Who are you? You're, you're a child of God. And if I just wake up, they say, Lord, help me realize who I am. And it doesn't produce arrogance. Obviously, it produces servanthood. Jesus said, I didn't come to be master and then be served by everybody. I came to serve. So we realize the same thing. I'm here to make a difference. So church is important because that's where, that's where we're, well, this is the kingdom. This is where the kingdom operates from, not the building, but the people, all right? We, we're here making a difference. We're going through, but hey, we're on a rescue mission as we pass through. We're catching everybody. Hey, this whole thing's going down. I hate to tell you, folks, if some of you putting all your investments in planet Earth, you're going to be sorely disappointed, especially if everything breaks, falls apart tomorrow. And all your little CDs and 401s, 402s, 403s, and everything else is going to go to pot and hammer. Well, I've got gold. It won't be worth anything. It'll do the same thing they did in the Depression. It's illegal to have gold. <laughs> you know, before we get all cocky and smart and what all we've done to accomplish, you better realize we're not so cocky, we're not so smart. There's a new day coming. Amen. And we had better be preparing hearts for it and bringing as many people as possible. So things change. Things of importance change, you know. What's important to me is you. What's important to me is the body of Christ. So what's important to me? And I'll see you every Sunday. See you this Wednesday. If it's important. Hello. Come on. I knew there comes that roaring silence again. <laughs> we'll move to the second part, but it won't be any happier unless you're, if you're not willing to agree with it. You see, their aspirations are high here. This higher concept is where they lived. It's what they thought about. It's what was made important sense to them. You know, it was something, it says they desired a better country. And if you read through Hebrews, you see better over. You see better testament, better covenant, better sacrifices, better things, better, better sanctuary. It's just better, 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 better. Let me, let, me, let me help you get that in your head. All right, some of you think what would be better is to have a different husband, a different wife, a different job, a different locale, whatever it might be, hire more. No, no, no. Better is everything God has for you. And if you'll set your sights on him and pursuing him and living the life of faith, it just gets better and better and better and better, 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 better. Yeah, you may go through suffering. This says they did. 
They dealt with a lot of pain, but it, just, it, it, it wasn't relevant because the bigger issue, the bigger picture. Yes, we sensed it, we felt it, we hurt, we grieved, we cried. It says they saw their loved ones sawn in two. The lions. But what happens here is, is they desired a better country. I like to say, the verse says, and they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a better country. In other words, it wasn't the words, it was their actions at this point. Their actions made a perfectly clear declaration, a plain declaration. They're all about something else than what the world is. Listen to what Jesus says. Pray like this. Our Father art in heaven. He goes through it and he uses this line. He says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the goal. I'm here for you, Lord God, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven in my life. You want to take it to the next step? You want to leave some mediocrity behind? You want to take it to another level in, in your spiritual walk, in your spiritual life? You're ready to grow just a little more? Then let that be your prayer. Say, Lord, not my will, but thy will. A better country, a better life. The aspiration here, the, the dream, the, the heart to, to receive, to believe. Listen to what David says in Psalms 27, verse 4. One thing have I asked from the Lord, and that shall I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And behold the beauty of the Lord. Listen, we are in the house of the Lord all the days of my life because he lives right here. And what I want to see here is the beauty of holiness and the beauty of the Lord as well as you. That we see God in our lives and that other people can see God in our lives. The third point here is determination. I want you to see, these people had a one-track mind. Verse 15, don't you say, they had the opportunity to turn back. Boy, I want you to know there's one thing that Satan will make clear in your life. It's always giving you the opportunity to turn back. A bunch of men here yesterday making commitments. It's a beautiful thing that was experienced. You know, as men responded to the Holy Spirit, we had a big cross up here and some nails and some wood. And as men would write down stuff on a piece of paper that they had there on the table, an area, the thing that was holding them up in their spiritual life. They came and they brought that up there and they nailed it to the cross. And then they returned, and after that we came up and everybody just grabbed any piece of paper off there and we went out to a little fire box we had outside and all threw them in the fire and praised God for forgiveness. You know, that, but I want you, I told them even at that point, I said, as soon as you leave here, you're gonna have an opportunity to turn back. It's always there, is it not? Satan's job, I mean, I, I don't know about you, you know, he, he lives on my front porch. I won't let him in. <laughs> but he camps at the gate, does he not? And waits for every opportunity he has to give you the opportunity to go back on what you told God you'd do. Or to resist. But these people says they didn't do it. They had the opportunity to turn it back, but they didn't do it. It says, it says they welcomed and saluted and held the word. In other words, they weren't double-minded. They, they kept the focus over here and not over there. You've heard me liken it before. Our, our spiritual life is this journey as we walk with Christ and we keep our eyes fixed on him and he's beside us and we're hand in hand enjoying our fellowship and enjoying him and, and really getting focused on our walk with God and focused on Christ. What happens is that all along the pathway of our journey, all these little imps of hell, every kind of fleshly and worldly and lustful thing and imagination is all on the side of the curb over there on the sidewalk saying, hey, psst, look at this. Or listen to this. Or you ought to know about so-and-so. Let me tell you, every side of the street's always doing that. And what you have to do is say, not interested. I'm looking here. I'm going to look here. I'm going to pursue. I have an aspiration that is married to a determination. And my love for Christ and my love for his word and my, my concept of having a holy fear of God in my life bring me to another level, to another place in my life. Hebrews 10, 37 says, yet a little while, and he that will come, will come, and will not tarry. Now, in light of that, he says, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. That's not what I want to see written over my life. That's not what I want to see written over your life. I am an imperfect man following a perfect Savior. There's going to be times when I may respond to an invitation to draw back. But because God lives in me and God lives in you, we will not stay there. 
We will forsake that and we will move forward. Our destination it, it follows the determination. And I use this a little bit with the aspiration, but I want to talk to you about it in another context of this. It says they desired a better country. You know, if you read verses 4 through 15, you, you see what I call pilgrim's progress, all right? As these pilgrims are going through pursuing the will of God. It's, they're just passing it. They, they had their, you know, we talk about GPS coordinates, you know? That the coordinates, we, we punch them in, we get an address set, and we follow it. Well, God has given us this godly GPS, this godly perspective coordinates, all right? That, that we, we, we put the word of God at the foremost and, and the, the center of our heart and life, and we say, that's the course that I'm following. And when determinations and frustrations and situations arise that seek to draw us apart from it, if we do fail, we get up. The Bible says a righteous man falls seven times, but yet he gets up. I'll let you know there's going to be failures. There's been failures in my life. There's been failures in your life. Points of disappointment. Points where Satan wants to have his, his say over our lives. Say, well, you think you're a Christian. You think you're saved. But we're not going to stay there. We're going to remember there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And we're going to take our position and set our sights and move out with God and say, hey, I desire a better country. That's my, that's my destination. That's where I'm headed. And as I desire that better country, I don't want to miss the opportunity that God's given me question is, where are you? If you go back and you look at those questions again, you know, where are you? Maybe you've listened to one of those little voices on the side that's pulled you over and you've kind of been to having a little debate with that. Get back on, on course. Get back on track. Maybe you've settled for what, what, what I can easily get drawn into many times in my life is religiosity over spirituality. I'm doing all the right stuff. But boy, you remember in that series on James, it said all that stuff about everybody was doing the right stuff, but their mouths and their hearts were really revealed by their actions or words. So I want to move away from that. So I need to be back to the heart of loving Christ, loving people, being gracious and being sympathetic and having a heart of mercy as we close that chapter out with last week. Set your sights, move out. What do you want? Now, there's that little statement in there. It starts that verse with, and some people kind of, it's, it's like a, a, a lament, a, a, a whoa. It says, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. That's not a down thing. That is supposed to be read as an up thing. They persevered even to death because they believed the promise. They went to, and by the way, if you follow the storyline, to and through the grave Amen. to see the promiser. So it's not something that you, you look down upon, oh, you know, God, God. hey. Because the truth of the matter is, God's promise is just as good as the reality of it. If you have a promise, what else do you need? Just as good as the reality. Faith is something that things hope for. The evidence of things not seen. They believed what they'd heard. They believed the word of God. Even though they couldn't sit physically with their eyes. Didn't get to witness it personally in this life. They pressed on. Boy, what determination, what commitment. But let me put it simple. That's just Christian faith. That's not, that's, not a, that's not beyond the call of duty. And I know so many Christians look and they look at kind of categorize. Well, I, 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 I'm not like Brother So and so. He's a real fireball. Well, I'm certainly not like Sister So and so. You know what she's like? Jesus said that when you compare yourselves with one another, you become fools. Pretty strong word, is it not? Who's my, who, who's my measuring standard? It's Jesus. You know, it, it's the Lord. So I come to him. Where am I in your sight? Where, what's going on in, in your sight? So I, I want my eyes and my heart to be upon you. So I'll just move forward and choose to honor you. I want you to love that passage when Samuel's speaking. And it's in chapter 2, around verse 28, 30, somewhere in there. He says, those that honor God, God will honor. Let's make it our business to honor God. God won't be ashamed. Let's make it our commitment to honor the Lord in our life. And, and I will say this, and we're going to talk about this in the next few weeks, that if I choose to do that, there's going to be, as we said here, some obvious things will be a part of my life. Let me say this. If you don't really want to go on to God with God, don't be here next Sunday. You're just going to be miserable. <laughs> All right? If you really want to go on with God... Be here. 
because I am seeking to challenge myself as well as you to go higher. The better country, the better life, the better sacrifice, the better savior, the better, the better world. Some of you are familiar that read Christian books, perhaps, with the name Dr. Stephen Olvert. He was the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in New York. Dr. Olvert's written a lot of good books and a great theologian of the Word of God. Uh, one day he had the opportunity of leading his brother to the Lord Jesus Christ. His brother was an agnostic most of his life. Later in life, he reaches his brother finally and gets saved. Shortly after that, getting saved, his brother comes down with a terminal illness. And uh, Dr. Olvert... Uh, got a message that one day he needed to come to the hospital quickly and he got there and seemed that there was this heaviness over his brother and he said, you know, uh, you know Richard, you know, it's going to be okay. You know, you've given your life to Jesus. You, you've committed your heart to Christ. You, you don't have to be afraid. You know, you, you're going to heaven. I mean, it's a, that's graduation. It's the best of all things. So you, you, you know, don't be afraid. Richard said, Stephen, you don't understand. I know I'm saved and I know I'm going to heaven. When I die... And it's not that I'm afraid to die. I'm ashamed to die. I don't want anybody, me included, to ever come to the end of our life and feel that way. Because we were pressing on. We were serving Christ. We were loving God. We were going through this planet like pilgrims, headed for another place. Me, like you. What was the old hymn that says, Here I am, Lord, prone to wonder. <laughs> we have this, because we're still in this vessel of flesh, this tendency to act out of the flesh more than we'd like. Amen. When we did the thing with the nails and the cross and the paper yesterday for the men who were here, I, I, gentlemen, I don't know what you put on yours. But what I put on mine was self. Because when you boil it down, everything I ever do wrong in my spiritual life boils down to me claiming rights to do it my way. Me. The thing I have to remember though is, is one Saturday a year at a men's wild game feast is not enough for me to nail it on the cross. <laughs> it has to be daily. Don't you, don't you want to, when you stand before the Lord, I really believe, and I've said this, I don't mean countless times probably to all of us, the words I think every genuine believer wants to hear when they stand before the Lord on that day is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Don't you, that's the longing that we ought to... I want to hear that from my master. I want to hear that from the Lord. It means more to me than hearing it from my mother, my wife, my children, you know, or anybody else. That I would hear that from the lips of Jesus. You done good. And I'll look up and say, Lord, I screwed up more stuff than I ever started right. <laughs> I messed up even trying to follow you thinking I was doing you well at times <laughs> well done it's the old thing of, you know at least if you're falling make sure you're falling in the right direction believers fellowship is a unique fellowship we've seen God do so many things but I don't think we have touched the hem of the garment in that regard of all that we can do for the glory of God in the days ahead of us. We're living in a time when, when it's unique. Most churches don't get the opportunity that we have. God's just bringing people to us. All right? This area is, is on the verge of the greatest boom it's seen in a long time, even greater than the last one that happened. Within miles of our church are thousands of new homes and families coming in. We cannot be content to just sit here and sing songs and hear sermons. God's putting you out there with them every day. In your jobs and schools, in the marketplace, in this gas station, the grocery store. Everywhere we go, we should be on that rescue mission. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about what I'm going to do. Let me invite you to my church. Let me see, you know, that'll be just part of our, our life because we know who we are. We're about a business. 
king's business. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's be united in that. Let's have the same vision of God, his promises, his word, his will. And let's serve him with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength. Because I want to see that one day, because the Bible tells me as a shepherd that I'm going to have to give an account for this flock. All right? That I will hear, that's a good group. <laughs> They've done good. Hey, I do not know that if God's going to make us all be in the same mansion for a few years or not. <laughs> so let's love each other now. And let's serve God with all our hearts, all our minds. You want to take it higher? That's the challenge. Let that be a challenge that rings around. I, I, want, to, I want to go further for God. Sitius, altius, fortius, however you say it. Stronger, higher, faster. Let's stand with our heads bowed.